All right, welcome to the 23rd Return to Freud, um, this time covering a paper titled On Narcissism from 1914. And just very quickly before I start um, giving an overview of this paper, I want to let everyone know that I am going to be running uh, two courses um, starting January 15th and a link uh, in the description to a website uh, called Philosophy Portal uh, can be found below. So um, if you're interested in either one of those courses, just check out the link and discover more on your own time. So with that being said, I'm going to start the um, lecture on narcissism and then afterwards open it up to uh, a discussion. Let's see. Mm. All right, on narcissism from 1914. Um, this is really uh, a remarkable and a unique paper um, in Freud's career. Um, it, it, it really is, a, I don't wanna say a turning point, but it, it, it seems to be a um, crucial developmental turn where Freud um, sort of, collects what has been learned about the, the transference neuroses um, and applies that knowledge to what he terms in this paper non-transference neuroses, um, namely neuroses that he believes are not treatable or curable with psychoanalysis. Um, and this is really um, a challenge, we might say, very clearly. Um, he sees as a, a challenge to libido theory, uh, basically insofar as libido theory could potentially explain um, narcissism um, and consequently what Freud terms non-transference neuroses. Um, it could be, and I'm just hypothesizing here, I'm not 100% sure, um, but I, I have some reason to believe from the paper that this is the case, that he is taking this turn in large part uh, as a response to the challenge of Jung, um, and specifically a challenge that Jung seems to lay down that the non-transference neuroses, specifically madness and schizophrenia, um, well, what I'm going to be calling madness and schizophrenia, uh, he uses different terms in the paper, um, escape libido theory. Um, but we're going to get into the, the specifics of that uh, throughout the, the overview of the paper. So specifically, he um, starts with the conventional or clinical description of narcissism, denoting an attitude of a person who treats his own body as a sexual object, looks, strokes, fondles, and gets complete satisfaction from one's own body. Um, Freud then sort of entertains the possibility that narcissism, and this is a challenge to the conventional notion of narcissism, may not be a perversion that has absorbed the entire subject's sexual life, but could actually be a libidinal complement to egoism uh, and the instinct of self-preservation. So already we see that Freud here is playing with the idea um, that narcissism is a, is a, a libidinal complement to the transference neuroses. Um, uh, as we'll see, it's kind of the opposite of the transference neuroses, where uh, the transference neuroses get caught up with fantasy objects outside of themselves. Uh, narcissism is the opposite, where um, uh, the subject gets caught up with its own ego as a libidinal object. So he wants to distinguish between primary and normal narcissism in understanding specifically madness and schizophrenia, what he calls dementia praecox, and uh, I think just refers to the other as, as, as schizophrenia, under the libido theory. And again, these are non-transference neuroses, namely non-relational neuroses. So defining the transference neuroses, um, and these are basically the neuroses of hysteria and obsessional neuroses that we have been covering throughout the entire return to Freud so far. Um, the ego has given up its relation to reality, but has not broken off its erotic relation to people or things. Um, rather, 
uh, still has a very strong imaginary relationship to, uh, to, to, to people and things. Um, whereas the non-transference neuroses um, are basically, basically megalomaniacal uh, and they're also diverted from an interest with people in the world and things, but without any imaginary substitutes. Again, there's just a fascination with one's own self. Um, consequently, Freud claims that the non-transference neuroses are inaccessible to psychoanalysis, uh, cannot be cured by our efforts, he says. So we're really here, he's diverging from uh, the foundation that he's built up this far in his career and is really pushing the theory. Um, and interestingly, he's saying here that narcissism is a pre-object libido and autoerotic. And as we'll find out, this is teaching us a lot about the foundation of the psyche and teaching us a lot about the original fixations and the original desires of the subject. So libido totally withdraws in schizophrenia and megaloman megalomaniacal behavior. Uh, and this is replacing object libido. So it becomes egoic or narcissistic instead of object libido. So you can see here, there's a very clear um, oppositional um, dynamic here that Freud is situating between object libido, where you develop the transference neuroses, hysteria and obsessional neuroses, and ego libido, uh, what is being termed narcissism. They're, they're kind of opposites. He claims that narcissism is similar to the mental life of children and primitive peoples, a more primitive mentality, um, characterized by an overestimation of one's own wishes and desires, uh, what he calls the omnipotence of thought. Um, this is very interesting because, uh, you know, children do live in a world where there is less of a distinction between fantasy and reality and where their desires are sort of um, identified with as a reality. Uh, children's play is often structured by this type of thinking. Um, I remember my own uh, childhood structured by this type of thinking and have observed many other children who exhibit this type of thinking. Um, basically, it's a belief in the supernatural force of one's own uh, words and basically magical thinking. Um, and through the magical thinking, um, there is basically a logical foundation for one's own quote unquote grandiose premises. Um, I have a, a funny story from anthropology that might be worth communicating here. Um, uh, it's a famous anthropological tale of when Westerners encountered people from Papua New Guinea. When Westerners arrived in Papua New Guinea, um, the people from Papua New Guinea uh, tried to imitate the act of being on an open field and waving down a plane, you know, like having sticks to wave down the plane, um, because they were basically operating with a magical thought that if they just went into the field and waved sticks in the air, that a plane would land, sort of suspending the entire chain of cause and effect. Um, simply because they didn't realize that there was an entire industrial technical apparatus that allowed Europeans to fly to their island and land with planes. But that's a type of example of the type of magical thinking. Um, you'll also, I also watched a documentary recent, recently of a, of a Cameroonian um, a Cameroonian warlord who controls all of his subjects with this same type of magical thinking. Uh, and and it, it's very interesting to watch. Uh, if anyone's interested, that documentary is on a, on a channel called Brut, B-R-U-T, a French, French channel. In any case, um, the form idea of the re religional libidinal uh, cathexis concentration of ego is typically given off to objects, but instead uh, persists internally. Um, Freud here makes reference to the amoeba. Uh, one can't help but notice that this is also um, the metaphor that Lacan uses to describe lamella. Um, and I, I do get many uh, hints here that, that um, what Freud's talking about here with narcissism and the structure of narcissism and its relation to the psyche does have something to do with what Lacan's analyzing as, as Lamella in, in his, his later um, sort of 
philosophical psychoanalysis, uh, playing around with deeper metaphysics. In any case, um, in Neuroses, Freud says we were only paying attention to the emanations of libido, that is the object libido, the object concentrations. Now we see its antithesis in ego libido or narcissism, and it's sort of the direct manifestation of libido itself. Um, he's then also continuing on with the oppositional dynamic between the ego libido and the object libido, uh, saying that when one is uh, employed or when one is more identified with, the other is depleted. So basically, um, if the object libido is what normal society considers love, um, the opposite is um, the opposite is sort of this narcissistic fantasy or paranoiac fantasy. Um, one can say here that the narcissist struggles to love or cannot love, you know, someone who's extremely narcissistic cannot love, they love themselves. Um, so they cannot love the other. And Freud here is not moralizing. Um, he's not saying one is better than the other or one is, is worse yeah. than the other. Um, Look at uh, just ask everyone to mute there. Um, but he's merely saying that uh, there's here this oppositional dynamic again, and, and what, we, what we commonly or what common society considers, um, what common society considers love, uh, narcissism is the opposite of that. So he then asked the question, what is the relationship between narcissism uh, and autoeroticism, namely early libido? Because um, he's claiming here, and, I, and we've covered this before, that the autoerotic nature, that libido is autoerotic. In some sense, libido is narcissistic. Um, and so what is the distinction here between narcissism and this original primary autoeroticism, if there is any? Um, he then goes on to say that pure transference neurosis is basically understood on the basis of what we come to know in psychoanalysis as the split subject. Um, just want to make sure everyone, everyone mutes themselves there because uh, it gets a lot of background noise. So uh, in the transference neuroses, we have the twofold existence or the split subject between the, the, the serving one's own purposes and serving the, the purposes of the sexual chain or the object. Um, he makes reference to the libido as a potentially immortal substance. So the individual in the, in the transference neuroses is basically struggling with the fact that it is an appendage of the germ pl plasm or immortal substance, um, which takes energy in the form of a bonus pleasure or orgasm. Um, then, you know, going based on that, you have this, you have this idea that the individual is a mortal vehicle or the ego for an immortal substance, the libido. You just think about this in relationship to the fact that life continues to go on. Libido has, you know, life force has continued to repeat itself for billions of years. Each one of uh, its manifestations, an individual organism, which is mortal and temporary. And so life here is, is, is potentially life as such is immortal, uh, but we as individuals are, are, are mortal uh, and simply the human being as a psychologically self-reflexive aware, uh, awareness of this uh, develops neuroses. Um, so there's the, and especially in civilization. So he says the antithesis between ego instincts or civilization persona and sexual instincts is really the split of the uh, uh, that's observed in the analysis of transference neuroses. Now he gets into uh, the Jungian critique of libido theory, and in this paper, Freud is um, sort of most clearly wrestling with the Jungian split from the foundation of psychoanalysis. And I think this is the first paper where he really strongly and, and, and um, you know, clearly uh, is criticizing Jung, whereas in many passages before this, he seems quite, um, you know, supportive and, and, and viewing Jung's own ideas as complementary to, to, to his own theory. 
Uh, to be precise about where they're differing is that Jung is saying that the non-transference neuroses, what I'm calling madness and schizophrenia, um, are not explainable by libido theory. And Freud thinks that's premature to suppose that uh, madness and schizophrenia are not describable by libido theory. This is where Jung's introducing the non-sexual libido. Um, and in my view, and I think in Freud's view as well, uh, Jung is over-identifying with states of madness and over-identifying with states of schizophrenia um, and basically, you know, perhaps even turning a religion out of madness and schizophrenia, um, maybe turning a religion out of narcissism. Um, in any case, that's, that's sort of how I'm viewing in this paper where, where, they're, where they're beginning to split off and, and, and disagree with one another. Uh, with that being said, Freud is still of the belief that studying narcissism, uh, madness and schizophrenia, give new insight into the psychology of the ego. Um, and he starts off by saying here um, that it's through organic pain or discomfort that the subject gives up interest in things in the external world that do not concern his suffering, and he withdraws libidinal interest from love objects. Uh, so long, he says, so long as he suffers, he ceases to love. Uh, the sick man withdraws libido back upon his ego. So again, you get this structure where narcissism is the opposite of what we commonly refer to as love. Um, and when he's going through describing this whole process of becoming narcissistic, um, one can't help but, or at least I can't help, um, but see some parallel with the, my own observations on people who, who go off into monastic life um, or people who go off into um, meditative life. Um, I, I even have made the point on several different occasions uh, that people who are going off into monastic life seem to be going off into monastic life due to a failure of love objects, um, namely a failure of their own capacity to quote unquote love in the external world um, and withdraw a recoil onto their own onto their own ego. Which here is a massive challenge, I think, to conventional uh, religious um, ideologies and 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 practices which uh, are explicitly engaged in this type of behavior. In any case, libido and ego are once more indistinguishable. In, uh, in the person who's withdrawing, the narcissistic person. He makes very interesting claims that the person in a narcissistic state is similar to a person in either extreme pain or sickness or a sleeping person. Uh, he, he, he actually describes sleep as a, a situation of, of narcissism where ego and libido are no more, uh, or which are, 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 are indistinguishable. Uh, he then asked the question, why is the damming up of libido, namely the failure of object libido, um, why should it, be, should it be experienced as so unpleasurable? And he gives the answer that it's related not only to tension, but a specific function of tension, um, a specific, uh, a specific, a speci as, let's say, a specific struggle with the other, um, to use maybe Lacanian terminology. Um, and then ask the really interesting reverse question, which is what makes it necessary at all for mental life to pass beyond the limits of narcissism for objects? So he's saying, basically, if the original function of the libido is a type of autoerotic narcissistic tendency, um, what is it about uh, our nature? Which, uh, why aren't we all just purely narcissistic, basically? Uh, why don't we remain narcissistic? Um, and his answer is that uh, a strong egoism or narcissism is a protection from illness, uh, as stated before, a painful tension. But the opposite is also true, that we must love also to prevent from becoming ill or the opposite of the ego. Um, so instead of pushing for a monastic life, uh, the opposite of narcissism would say, turn your narcissism into some sort of a creative endeavor. And of course, people's typical object libido, um, namely falling in love with a sexual opposite, is a creative act because you're oftentimes people who are falling in love 
uh, with the opposite sex are engaged in the creative act of having children and raising a family. Um, but here's a quote from Hein uh, that Freud references that says, illness was no doubt the final cause of the whole urge to create. By creating, I could recover. By creating, I became healthy. Now, that doesn't have to be creation of a child. That doesn't have to be, um, you know, uh, using your libido to, uh, you know, form uh, an object relationship with the opposite sex and having a child. That could also be a creative act that is just purely cultural. Like, for example, what I'm doing right now is a creative act. And I even consider that most of my behavior is um, a act of creation that prevents me from becoming seriously ill. Uh, so I, I see my creation as, a, as an act of, uh, it's like a medicine. I become, I become healthier by creating. So the psychic apparatus, uh, Freud says, is a device for mastering excitation, which would otherwise be distressing. Um, and it works by helping the mind discharge or clear tension. So what Freud's saying here basically is that in between the extremes of object libido and ego libido, there is this tension, um, which on one extreme or the other can make you ill. Um, and it's kind of about becoming aware of this tension um, and working with this tension uh, in a way that you can create. Um, and in a way that you can maintain some sort of satisfaction and joy um, while you are alive. In any case, the narcissistic uh, ego, egoic or megalomaniacal uh, dimension of this oppositional determination is, again, the opposite of the transference neuroses, where instead of becoming pathologized by the introverted fantasies of the hysteric or the obsessional neurotic, you um, you again identify with them as, as yourself. Um, and this capacity, he says, gives us deep insight into the structure of the psychic apparatus, specifically in related to the origin of the satisfaction of the ego instincts. Um, and that the original satisfaction of the ego instincts is related to the earliest feeding, the earliest care, the earliest protection. Um, the first ex the first sexual experience is namely uh, the substitutes for the mother. Uh, he then says that perverts and homosexuals in general, uh, instead of taking their love objects as uh, a model for the mother, take their first sex objects as a model for their own self. And so he's claiming here that perverts and homosexuals are a little more uh, on the narcissistic end of the spectrum. Uh, so he explicitly says that homosexuals are looking for themselves in their, in their love object. Um, and that human beings uh, have two different types of sexual objects. They can take their own self or they can take the woman who nurses them. Uh, what, what he is going to go on to develop here, again, continuing the theme of narcissism being a uh, more... Um, ego libido and, and the transference neuroses being more the object libido is basically saying that the people struggling with neuroses are almost struggling with the image of the, the, say, the woman who originally was nursing them or caring for them, whereas the narcissist is struggling with their, their own self directly, it seems to me. Um, and that this uh, does show up in sexual division or sexual difference. Uh, he claims that the general male and female, the man is more likely to fall on the end of the complete object love uh, in the form of the sexual overvaluation of woman. And woman is tending to love in an intensification of the original narcissism, which interestingly he claims is quote unquote purer or truer. Um, so again, Freud is not moralizing narcissism here. Uh, he's even seeming to suggest here that narcissism is purer or truer, um, which I think is, again, remarkably interesting. Um, there's so many comments here that that I could I could that 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 uh, that I was thinking about while um, while coming up with this, but uh, perhaps we'll save them for the discussion after. Uh, so very interesting. He makes a lot of interesting comments about narcissism and women. Uh, specifically, he said 
that women with good looks tend to develop a self-contentment with themselves. They love themselves with comparable intensity to a man's love for a beautiful woman. Um, so you get here the dynamics that he's describing and, and also why, you, why, uh, why there's this uh, strong sexual division here um, uh, at work in, in psychoanalysis. He says, women generally need not, uh, need not in directly loving, in other words, directly loving the man, um, but in being loved, the one who finds favor in them, while on the other side, men find women's narcissism attractive and mysterious. Uh, he then goes on to make interesting comments about the charm of a child lying in its own narcissism, uh, self-contentment and inaccessibility. Um, and I think that that's also something that... Uh, some women give off in, 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 this, in this narcissistic tendency as well, this, this sort of this presentation. And, and again, what he's Freud saying men find attractive is that, that women can find this self-contentment and inaccessibility or present this inaccessibility, um, which is, is attractive. Um, he then says also that animals like cats, but also humans like criminals and humorists develop narcissistic tendencies that display similar, uh, similar tendencies. Uh, he says, for narcissistic women, their attitude towards men is cool, quote unquote. They don't get super, uh, super, uh, again, not sexually overvaluating men, as men often do for women, sexually overvaluating them. Uh, but that their road to object love comes in the bearing of a child, where a part of their own body confronts them as an external object. Um, and you might even say that men often experience love in that way, like that they, they, they confront women as a part of their own body, which confronts them as an external object, or maybe that's actually the, the, what's, what's going on with the penis, is that a part of their own body is confronting them as an external object that they can't control. Uh, in any case, some women also love by the masculine form, i.e. sexually over-evaluating the opposite of men. Although it's less common, he says that it's typically women who have a boyish, boyish nature in childhood, uh, which is retained into their sexual maturation. Um, and then goes on to say that there are two forms, narcissistic love, namely what the self is, was like, was, sorry, what the self is, what the self what the self was or what the self was like to be. And an eclectic love, which is either a woman who feeds him or a man who protects her. So you get this, I mean, I, 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 this, this oppositional dynamic that's emerging in this paper is, is again, I think very clear. It's a formal, a formal difference that is being played around with here uh, in a dynamic between the one and the other, I think, in its most simple essence. Um, and uh, also very interesting in, in relationship to the split and the dialectics of the process. It's, to me, very clear what he's describing here. Uh, then perhaps another super interesting dimension of this paper, he goes on to describe parental nar narcissism, uh, which is directed towards the child uh, and he claims that it's a revival and reproduction of their own infantile narcissism, which they abandoned to have the child. I think this is evidence that if you are on the narcissistic end of the, uh, of the spectrum, you probably shouldn't have children, especially if you're not willing to give up your own narcissism for the child. Uh, or haven't worked through your own narcissistic tendencies for the child, because in some sense, having a child is being decentered onto the child. The child becomes the new center of attention. Um, in any case, in extremes with the parental narcissism, they ascribe a perfection to the child and they conceal and forget his or her shortcomings and also deny that the infant is sexual, namely denying uh, infantile sexuality and their own projection here at work in the narcissistic tendency. Uh, they claim that he claims that the parental narcissism also um, tries to protect the child from the pains and the struggles that they had growing up. Uh, he says, quote unquote, his majesty, the baby, and they want the boy to become a great man or a hero. And they want they, the girl to marry a prince or to marry a great man. Um, one can't help but reflect on how this parental narcissism is actually at the foundation of the Buddha story. Um, in the Buddha story, uh, the Buddha was sheltered 
from every tension, was sheltered from every potential tragedy, um, and treated like a treated like a narcissistic love object before breaking the narcissism. Um, in future studies, Freud says we should pay attention to what disturbs the original narcissism and the reactions of the self to protect itself and the paths it takes to do so. Uh, he says this points towards the castration complex, namely that boys gain anxiety about their penis and girls envy for the penis. Again, you have the uh, asymmetry, the sexual difference here. And the castration complex itself is... Um, identifiable in the traces of the vicissitudes endured by libido. Um, and you can infer from the existence of the complex an epoch where the psychic situation, when the instinct was operating in unison, namely before the sexual division, when the libido was one. Uh, for Freud, the libido is one. For Freud, the libido is masculine. And it undergoes uh, a division um, in the vicissitudes of the, of the psyche because uh, it cannot be one. Uh, it cannot be purely autoerotic. Um, it cannot be, it cannot remain in this narcissistic self sort of reference with itself. The pathogenic repression occurs uh, when libido comes into conflict, conflict with cultural ethical ideals, uh, where the individual submits basically to the ideals uh, that are are made on him, and and there, this is where you get the split that becomes the transference neuroses in the in the construction of an of an enormous superego, where you identify with the superego, you identify with the ego ideal. Um, although the repression is coming from the ego itself, and he says the self respect of the ego, uh, quote unquote, the impressions, experiences, and impulses of the id are stifled before ever entering consciousness, that's the repressive tendency, uh, by the ideal ego, which is striving to um, maintain itself in relationship to the superego, maintain itself in relationship to the cultural ethical ideals of the society. Um, the ideal ego here, uh, and now you're getting, we're getting the formation now of the, 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 the neuroses and the transference neuroses is that it's basically like the opposite of the narcissism where instead of directing all of the self-love at yourself, you're directing self-love at the ideal ego. And this creates the phenomenon of extreme disembodiment. Uh, you become extremely disembodied from yourself because you're basically getting all of your enjoyment from the ideal ego, which is not you or not your actual ego. He makes the distinction between the actual and the ideal. So the narcissism is, he's basically saying the narcissism gets deplaced, displaced from, from, from the self onto the new ideal possessed by perfect value. Uh, in the end, what's going on here is that man is incapable of giving up on satisfaction he once enjoyed, enjoyed in childhood, uh, and it shifts, moves around to the ideal ego from the actual ego. Um, and it's a, a, a substitute for the lost narcissism. So in, in any case, the, the ideal ego is a substitute for the lost narcissism and the sort of the, the desire to once again enjoy the same joy that he had in childhood. He then makes an important distinction between the ideal ego and sublimation, where sublimation concerns the object libido, although it achieves uh, uh, it, its object libido without repression. And ultimately, when I read Freud, I get the idea, and, and I, I try to apply this in my own life, to be honest, is um, that sublimation is the ethical pathway by which one remains committed to the object libido and remains committed to the world uh, without repression, um, if one can sort of handle the tension that comes with that process. Whereas the ego ideal, uh, it's basically typically the traditional religious person who's over-identifying with the ego ideal, he says they confuse facts about the instincts of sublimation um, and, and become further separated from themselves. So basically exchanging narcissism for homage to an ego, ego ideal does not succeed in sublimating the libidinal instincts because the ego is basically impotent. So it cannot basically... Um, through its own imaging, overcome 
uh, the libidinal instincts. It does not accept itself. Uh, in some sense, the person of the ego ideal hates themselves um, and are uh, torturing themselves in many, in many cases um, and probably massively embarrassed um, about themselves. So the formation of an ideal heightens demands on the ego, and of course they're going to fail those demands. Uh, the repressed subject will, will eventually confront some sort of catastrophe or will likely con confront some catastrophe. Whereas, as I said, sublimation is a way to meet the demands of the ideal without repression. And, and in my view, that's sort of the ethical path that, at least in my case, that I, I, I've, I've sort of, I think that's, and I think that's what Freud's suggesting too, is that sublimation is really the path uh, that one can walk uh, without either repressing or withdrawing um, while accepting one's libido um, and, and, and sort of navigating the tension with the other. As I would, that's, how, that's how I would sort of frame it. Uh, so he says that there's a psychic agency which is constantly measuring the difference between the ideal and actual ego and that that's what we have come to call the conscience. Um, and that the person who's got a narcissistic tendency or a me megalomaniacal tendency um, basically views this, has a deeper relationship in some sense with the conscience, uh, although it manifests constantly in this feeling of being watched or noticed. They're almost, they're, they're, I don't know if they're closer to it or if they, they have some sort of different psychic relationship to it, because Although I know the feeling of being watched or noticed, I, I, I've never suffered from delusions of being watched or noticed in the way that a, a megalomaniacal person may. Um, and also he says that the subject in rebelling against this conscience will start to construct paranoiac systems. I, I take this to be the tendency of many individuals to construct conspiracy theories um, and, and also, I, I, I don't have the mind or the type of mind uh, that experiences life in this way. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm always very skeptical of conspiracy theories and people who are quick to come up with conspiracy theories. I view them as paranoiac systems. Um, but Freud's here saying that this is sort of a, a functioning of, of, the, of the, the narcissist or the, the, the megalomaniacal schizophrenic. So it goes on to say that the narcissistic omnipotence and the, is, is basically a high self-regard, uh, and it's not a bad thing, but it's all the primitive feelings of the libido and the, omni, the omni, omnipotence of thought being concentrated on oneself um, at the expense of transference. So again, we have this oppositional dynamic that's been the feature of the entire paper, um, which is that you have a high self-regard and a low transference neuroses with others. Um, everything's concentrated on the self. Um, so the libidinal object concentration does, uh, is, just, is just much, much lower. Again, it's, it's, there seems to be a trade-off of libidinal energy with this dynamic. Um, now, for the person who develops the transference neuroses, you have the libidinal object concentration, which does not raise one's self-regard. Um, basically, because all of the, the, all of the libido is put onto the loved object, um, and he says that a person in love is humble. Um, although, uh, in that sort of object libido, in, in the sort of loving the other, uh, you forfeit narcissism, but you can only do that if you are being loved in return. Namely, if you love somebody uh, deeply and they do not return your love, uh, Freud would say here that, that this is not possible to maintain. You, you can't maintain that because you feel too, too empty. Um, but there are some people, of course, who, who will develop a strong neurosis in this, in, this, in this situation. And in general, people who struggle with the uh, transference neuroses often do feel inferior. Um, I think that this is whether, whether uh, you know, whether they are, again, whether the transference is, is with a sexual lover, lover or a professional, uh, professional relationship, there's this feeling of being inferior in relationship to the other. So neurotics often, and this neurotics are the people that psychoanalysis deals with, 
are often struggling with an inferiority complex from their own libidinal concentrations, um, which they're, they're, they're again, it, it's basically repeating what I've said before about this relationship between the sexual, uh, the, the being a split subject between the, se the, the sexual trends and the ego trends, and the ego is basically injured um, and have a low self-regard. Uh, he makes an interesting point about self-regard and object concentrations, uh, namely that the uh, subject who loves uh, in a state of longing or the subject who loves in a state of deprivation, uh, basically, you know, loving without it being returned to you or loving in relationship to an impossible other lowers one's self-regard, um, whereas being loved or possessing the loved object raises one's self-regard. So, I mean, the maybe a cliche or a simplistic example here would be someone like if you take, for example, the incels, uh, that's probably a social phenomenon that's uh, most uh, related to loving in this state of longing or, or, or deprivation, and they have no self-regard for themselves. Whereas people who are highly sexually desirable uh, would have a high self-regard because uh, you know, they, they constantly feel quote unquote loved or that they can possess the loved object. Uh, he then makes a synthesis, and I guess this is where Freud comes to an understanding of what does happy love, quote unquote, mean. Uh, and he says it corresponds to a primal condition, uh, the original condition, basically, in which object libido and ego libido cannot be distinguished. This is interestingly also the case uh, of sleep. Uh, sleep is also where object libido and ego libido cannot be distinguished. Um, and, and, and he's not here saying, he's not here sort of saying how this is to be achieved, but he is, you know, whether it's not coming in the form of a man and a woman united in a happy marriage or not, it, it might even be something that's capable of being achieved in a sublimated form. Um, I, I, I'm thinking now of, of yogic practice, which I think is basically trying to describe this, this condition, except describing this condition achieved within oneself uh, and not with a, a sexual other. Um, nonetheless, this is sort of like the, uh, the, 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 you might say the synthesis between the object libido and the ego libido uh, that Freud is, is working towards uh, throughout this paper. Um, he then goes into the development of the ego itself, and he says that in the development of the ego, you have a departure from primary narcissism, and at the same time, a vigorous attempt to recover that original state or the displ displaced libido onto the ego ideal. Uh, in my own thinking about my own development, I would say that my development as an academic was a departure from primary narcissism and consequently, simultaneously, a radical split inside myself with the ego ideal. Um, where I was trying to recover the original state. And since then, I mean, I'm just trying to give an example of how one might experience this in their professional development. Um, uh, there's two dimensions of it where the self-regard of the primary narcissism is, uh, is the infantile state, whereas the experience of the fulfillment of the ego ideal is the object libido. And again, this happy balance between the two is, I think, what Freud is, is pushing for, um, to be one's own ideal once more as in childhood, uh, quote unquote, this is what people strive to attain in happiness. The, he describes it really well, I think, the flowering over of ego libido onto the object. Um, so Freud is not here ethically supporting any type of withdrawal, ultimately. Um, he's also... Um, sort of not favoring simply this object libido, which depletes the ego libido. It's rather the flowering over of ego libido onto the object. And this is the final slide here, uh, where he talks ultimately about neurotics um, and what they struggle with. So he says, whatever object fulfills the condition for infantile love is idealized, uh, and the sexual ideal can replace the narcissism. Uh, specifically with the lack in the ego is what is loved in the other. So um, again, when I think about my own sexual partners or when I think about the people, the, the women I have loved in my life, uh, it makes sense to me uh, 
that what I am loving is in fact a lack in my own ego um, and that I am idealizing actually probably my mother, probably my original feelings, my original sensations uh, when I was an infant myself. Um, but the neurotic struggles with excessive object concentrations on the other. Um, and again, that's the opposite of the, the, the narcissist. Um, and as a consequence of that, you have an impoverished ego. You feel empty inside um, and you're incapable of fulfilling the ideal, especially if you're incapable that the, nar the neurotic is by definition incapable of fulfilling the ideal. Since if it was fulfilling the ideal, it probably wouldn't be neurotic. Um, and then in that case, seeks a way back to narcissism. So narcissism is, again, this opposite of the neuroses. And you, you need to balance the two. You, in some sense, you have to be narcissistic to some degree. You have to include yourself. You have to care about yourself. You have to concentrate some of your libido towards yourself and treat yourself as a sexual object in some sense, um, while also trying to confront the world. Um, and that's, that's, that's a maturation of the, of the narcissism. Um, and then finally concludes by saying that, and of course his, his final thoughts are really about the neurotic since that's what psychoanalysis can deal with. Uh, basically saying that the neurotic prefers to be cured by love as opposed to analysis, but says that uh, that is only because the person in a neurotic state cannot believe another cure is possible and that we might be satisfied with this cure, except by the fact that the neurotic who is cured by love uh, is forced into a crippling dependence on the other. Uh, and in that situation, I would just again re-emphasize that when I study the yogis, what the yogis seem to be doing is ultimately pushing towards some sort of relationship between the ego libido and the object libido, which is a, a balance and a harmo harmony, a tension. Uh, there's a harmonious tension within oneself between the, the ego libido and the object libido, but it's within oneself as opposed to in the sexual relationship. Um, at least that's my analysis of what the yogis are up to. And that's narcissism. Very interesting paper. I'm sorry if that was too long. It was a very complicated paper in some dimensions. Um, but let's, let's just discuss it. I'd, I'd be interested to see what you guys have to say. Thank you, Carol. This is excellent. Thanks, Mika. Yeah. So, uh, narcissism, that's really a daunting task to discuss. And the paper itself, as you said, is so rich. It has so much connections to all, all kinds of things, but reading it, I will felt like I started to understand what's, what's, uh, Freud's view about the relations of man and uh, reality overall. And when we, when we yeah. use the very notion of narcissism, I mean, uh, what do we really mean by narcissism and what does Freud understand with narcissism? Yeah. Here I would like to uh, elaborate on a few thoughts that I have regarding this. Namely because when we are discussing uh, some type of narcissism in contemporary, like popular uh, psychological, uh, one could say in psychologistic ideas, popular psychology and so on. Usually narcissism is taken as some kind of like really negative bad thing. And then there are these um, more uh, elaborated terms, like somebody would use a hyper narcissism, we would, speak about the cultures of narcissism and also there is the whole category of like pathological like narcissistic personality disorders and all these type of things without ever really having a clear structure in the way that Freud gives in in this paper so when we are talking about somebody who is the narcissist I mean we are really talking about some kind of uh, crucial component of the ego itself. I mean, the ego itself is a uh, narcissistic personality disorder in some sense. So also when uh, we are reading this Freud, we, I think we should remember that uh, the concept of narcissism, narcissismus concept, uh, it isn't really developed before Freud in this way. I mean, he 
the, the paper is entering the uh, narcissism. Uh, so uh, Freud is giving here introduction of narcissism and not to narcissism. Uh, narcissism doesn't exist as a concept in this way before Freud, and he really gives it a clear structure and the tension that he plays with uh, between uh, neurotic and what you call, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, transferential neur neurosis and yep. non-transference neurosis. neurosis. I'm a bit unsure if, if that works too well because, well, Freud is clearly um, focusing on the difference between structures of psychosis and neurosis. So, how would we? How would you say that the? Uh, I mean, some general comment comes to mind, uh, but since when we are talking about narcissism in contemporary uh, overall understanding, usually what gets, in my view, uh, mistranslated as some kind of narcissistic disorder is just psychosis, right? Sometimes it's- Yeah, so I think we would call it psychosis. Yeah, most, yeah. yeah. He's so not I, using that language, but- Yeah, so I was like, trying to figure out what's the benefit of using the term of non-transferential neurosis when, well, we could just say that Freud is discussing with paraphrenia and schizophrenia and uh, paranoia, this form of uh, psychosis. Well, he does use the term non-transference in the paper, but if we're going to get rid of that, like what, what it seems to me to be at work is that in, in the neuroses, which Freud is saying psychoanalysis can approach, what we're dealing with is the um, the sort of the way in which the libido is relating to the other. Whereas in, in narcissism or in the psychosis end, the libido is simply, it's more self-referential. It's not related to the other or the other is radically within. Do those categories, do those words make sense to you? Is that, is, is that what you're trying to, to, to get to? I'm That's how sure. I'm, I'm, I'm making sense of it as the, the person who's struggling with, with transference neuroses or the hysteria or the obsessional neuroses is dealing with the libido's relationship to the other outside of themselves. Whereas the narcissist is in the opposite direction. Uh, Alexandra. Maybe if, if I may just shortly. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Mika, and then I'll okay, go on this topic it, since it's really crucial. And um, I mean, I would like to return to uh, the way that Lacan uh, comments on Freud's uh, paper on narcissism in his first seminar. Since uh, there, in his first seminar, um, Lacan thinks that what is crucial for Freud is grasping the difference in structure which exists between the withdrawal from reality which we observe in the neurosis and that which we observe in the psychosis. So this is what really, it's, it's a clear point that Freud is sort of like playing with its tension all the time in the paper. So uh, what Freud says that what lacks uh, in psychosis, uh, it's the type of like phantasmatic, like when, when uh, neurotic withdraws from reality, there is this a uh, fantasy that the neurotic then operates on fantasy creations and formations that seek out to get into the world, back into erotic relation with the world. But instead, the psychotic constructs a secondary process, uh, some kind of like uh, fake reality, we could say, which then occupies their whole mind in some way. So Lacan has a good point about this. Um, well, in Freud's conception, the function of imaginary cannot be the function of unreal uh, because the psychotic really lacks access to the imaginary. It isn't so much as that the uh, psychotic is lost in their dreams, lost in their fantasies. That's not the case. What you have in psychosis for Lacan is instead that they are really located in some structure that should be located as a symbolic unreal, as symbolic that is unmarked by unreal. And the function of imaginary is somewhere completely else. And uh, the reason why um, Lacan takes this to be the key is that when uh, you see uh, how psychotic reconstructs his world, what you find there 
is this words, therefore the category of symbolic, but a symbolic that's only dealing with the real or even, uh, sorry, uh, symbolic marked by unreal, sorry. Okay, um, Alexander, did, okay, yes, did, Al, Al, you. did you, did you want to intervene? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, first of all, uh, for the beautiful uh, painting of Caravaggio. Uh, I love it so much. And um, if I dare just to, to say some words of uh, his myth of uh, Narcissus, that's a Greek myth. And uh, can I say some words, just very short? Of course. Okay. Um, so uh, this Narcissus was the son of river gods and of a nymph. And he was known for his extraordinary beauty and he was loved by God Apollo. He was proud and he disdained those who loved him. He was once walking near a river or a lake and he wanted to drink some water and then he saw his own reflection in the water and fall in love with it. Uh, but he did not realize that this was just an image. That's very important. He fall in love just with an image. And um, unable to leave the beauty of his reflection, Narcissus lost his will to live. He stared at his reflection until he died. He could not obtain the object of his desire. So uh, what I wanted to say is that um, um, having a hysterical reaction, because I know uh, a little Lacan's theory, um, I, I would like to demystify to demystify this concept of narcissism, if I dare, in a hysterical way. I want to question, I think this concept of narcissism is just a trap for us. And that's why all these ambiguities between uh, uh, object uh, versus ego, libido, uh, inside versus outside, um, uh, because uh, in a way, I think that uh, this very used concept of narcissism in the modernity and postmodernity by psychology, by psychoanalysis, by philosophy, by us here and now, this concept of narcissism is a trap. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and I will propose two ideas, mm -hmm. two arguments, let's say. Why is it a trap? And I, I, I'm waiting for counter arguments. First of all, it is a trap because uh, what is uh, this ego? Can be the ego. What is the ego? Lacan is telling us that the ego is an image. Yes, it's uh, le stade de miroir. It's the mirror stage. So it's something that does not exist. It is something that has no substance, no essence in itself. It's just imaginary. You see this image and you consider that you are this image. So it's a false identity. It's not a real one, it's imaginary identity. And um, so that's one argument. Uh, there is no narcissism. There is no, it has no consistency. It's just illusory. Um, in the same time, we can think about Lacan's theory that um, of Möbius band, when uh, interior transforms in exterior, when the most uh, intimate interior place of myself is in the same time, the extimate, the most exterior, the most uh, strange, the most... Um, uh, how to say uncanny thing. And the third argument is that uh, my desire is the desire of the other. 
So there is no consistency of this narcissism. First is the desire of my mother. First is the gaze of my mother. First is the other. So the ego, which is founded on narcissism, is has no consistency. There is no such a thing. Only we identify with something that does not exist. And this provokes a lot of sufferance. Maybe I'm too extreme. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I hope I provoke discussions. All right. Thanks, Alexandra. Eric, did you want to continue, continue on from that? Or uh, yes. from what Mika um, was saying? I'll I'll try to I'll try to weave both Mika and, and uh, Alexander's comments, which were excellent. Um, so I, I think like a lot of us, I was trying to put together the Lacanian coordinates for um, for this paper, and um, of course Lacan does not use the term libido very much at all, especially in his later works, where I think the the concept of jouissance works in, in a similar space. Um, and, and I want to I want to point out there's a wonderful paper by Jacques Alain Miller called The Prisons of Jouissance. And I'm going to try to put it put it in the chat. Um, uh, I'll have to, have to do that later. But anyway, it's um, he, he is trying to bring attention back to the imaginary order. And deriving from some of the, the late Lacan seminar 22 and later where the imaginary order contains a certain jouissance of the body. Um, and he says in this paper, um, we, we find in the analytical experience, these unforgettable images that cannot be effaced images that appear to contain jouissance, which retain it, which imprison the jouissance of the subject. And I think that is uh, uh, something that we can, we can think about how the, the concept of jouissance becomes imprisoned in the body. Uh, and what, what, what is this? Let's, let's kind of unpack this, this notion of of this jouissance of the body, which I think is, and, and uh, 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 Miller brings this out, is uh, very similar to Lacan's notion of the, the jubilation in the mirror stage. And, and you can see this in Freud's paper, and I'll try to bring it back to, to Freud here. This is page 94 of the standard edition. Uh, Freud says this ideal ego and, and notice that the terms here, uh, Freud does not always maintain a distinction between the ego ideal and the ideal ego, like Lacan does, but he does here. And I think Lacan may be picking up on this in his development of the notion. This ideal ego is now the target of the self-love, which was enjoyed in childhood by the actual ego. Okay, there's the mirror stage. There's the jubilation of the mirror stage, the formation of the ideal ego, which in the graph of desire is, is indicated by the lowercase i capturing the lowercase a. The specular image. Yeah, the specular image, right, right. Uh, the subject's narcissism makes its appearance displaced on this new ideal ego, which like the infantile ego finds itself possessed of every perfection that is of value. Okay, so this is the first instance uh, of a kind of a capturing of the jouissance of the body. Um, and, and it is only in the later development of the ego ideal, right, that a phallic jouissance, the jouissance of the signifier, is uh, developed in that place. So where the, this jouissance of the, of the body, of the specular image is seated in in favor of this new jouissance of the signifier that comes from, from the other. And, and so when we're talking about narcissism, quote unquote, what we're really talking about is something uh, 
you know, if we take this, the binary of the neurotic psychotic, it's something on the side of the, of, of psychosis. Um, it is, it is a, um, a turning away from phallic jouissance and a, and a return towards a jouissance of the body where that jouissance of the body, as Miller says, becomes attached and imprisoned uh, within the body. And the, the course of analysis, the, the, the clinical uh, course has to take that into account of, of how to, to deal with the, this jouissance uh, as something within the imaginary rather than being something within the symbolic. Um, so I think that kind of picks up somewhere where, where um, Mika was, was talking about. And, and, I, and, and I think it's interesting here what he's put up this quote from seminar one in the chat. Um, I think there, there may be, of course, the, the classical Lacanian formula is that psychosis is a foreclosure of the symbolic, right? Um, and so it's, it's, it's interesting to see what, what he's actually saying in seminar one about a, a symbolic unmarked by, by the unreal. I'm not entirely sure what he means by that at that point, but I think we can see uh, how these concepts do align um, where uh, the, the notion of narcissism, whatever we, however we understand that is a, um, something within the imaginary order. And, and that is where the course of analysis uh, really needs to focus. And, and so just to try to pick up where Alexandra was, um, is yeah, let, let's, let's maybe not talk about narcissism per se as a as a particular disorder but or or you know object libido ego libido and this sort of thing. but but a, a capture or an imprisonment of jouissance uh, where where's jouissance that that um could be experienced in terms of something symbolic uh has become imprisoned within the imaginary and it is it's an image based and it is uh, attached to the body. Um, the, the very late Lacan, the last Lacan, makes a, a direct equivalence between the imaginary and the body. Um, and, and so I think that that is where in a, in a Lacanian coordinate we, we can locate um, this, this concept of narcissism. Thank you so much. That's, that's yeah, that, that's, that's brilliant. Um, again, I'm getting this, 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 this opposition at work between the body and the other in the symbolic sense, and also sort of a, an opposition between the neuroses and the transference neuroses that originally occupy psychoanalysis and our modern world, which seems to be more struggling with the opposite, or at least struggles intensely with the opposite in terms of a more psychotic tendencies and a more foreclosure of the symbolic. Um, I'm, specific, I'm specifically thinking about the tendency I see in a lot of people, both men and women, to becoming caught up in fantasies of the body, which are foreclosures of the symbolic or foreclosures of external engagement with the world. Whether that's, I know a lot of guys who are, you know, in, in, in locked into video games 24-7 uh, or, or uh, a lot of, for example, um, teenagers who are locked into Instagram or TikTok or, or, or these types of social media image-based platforms. Um, but that there's this relationship, like that, that maybe these, these social media outlets are... Um, prisons of jouissance they are you know to, to use the language that you're you're developing there um eric that's that's the things that's coming to my mind or, or right also away. uh how about like homosexual uh, libido also yeah doesn't freud like locate um uh, some type of like homosexual libido at the bottom of what lacan would call this imaginary uh register 
in this even in this even in this paper freud freud situates homosexuality and perversion more on the side of this Im imaginary fixation with one's own body yeah but also when we use even the concept of self-image it has to be some type of for freud freud's uh, libido theory some type of identificatory formation which has this like allocation of libido or catexis of libido in it. And since it happens in this our like own internal space, even one could say, the self-image formations with all their like unconscious residues that we could unpack in an analysis and everything. So when we use the very notion of having a self-image, like positive self-image, negative self-image, and so on, doesn't it imply some type of homosexual like foundation for it, which Lacan would say that this like uh, mm -hmm. final word about narcissism itself uh, relates, he, 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 I mean, he just points out in, in, in seminar four also that uh, the relation of man to his image is basically the final word of narcissism. And when we are in contemporary society, we can see clearly how like man's relation or human's relation to image really functions more and more clearly in social media and everything. We can see the type of like proof for the theory. And what Freud, say, Freud says is that in here, uh, it's a relation where the model is really the own image. The model is the self and trying to seek oneself as a love object. And this is what is, the reason for adopting the hypothesis of narcissism. So if this even sounds familiar to anybody, like I, I would say it's just nonsense to say that there is no such thing as, it's just pure, like, uh, I would say it's, it's just a pure gesture of arbitrariness to say that there is no such thing as narcissism, which I, I think is counterproductive in the extreme. Yes, Mika, you're right. I was uh, making, uh, I was going to a limit by provoking uh, this, uh, uh, putting uh, into the brackets of the concept narcissism. I'm, I'm aware that um, uh, this, we need this uh, imaginary uh, mirror stage of unity of our body. So the unity of our body, this is a stage in our development in our individuation but if we stay fixed on it till the end we die if we are identified 100 percent with it we die we are not alive because uh, uh, body is not only an image an object body is more than an object we are talking about different bodies okay uh Chitan, uh, do, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, hi, hi, Kadil. Thanks for a wonderful presentation, actually. It's a really interesting paper. And uh, to be honest, uh, this got me thinking of a discussion in group psychology, actually, about the question of the leader, if we, if we all remember, uh, the question of the leader becoming part of superego through the ego ideal. I think Eric would remember that uh, much better than I do in that sense. But uh, uh, you know, the discussion actually was centered around this problem that a child actually identifies with the male uh, when he's sort of young and he sort of, you know, female becomes an object uh, libido in that sense. And the, the split actually happens at the very starting point where he, where he identifies the power figure in that sense. And he uh, sort of makes the female, and, and in some cases it becomes the reverse and homosexuality emerges from there in, 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 that, in that manner. So what what I'm, what I'm trying to sort of point out over here is, is there a relationship between this ego ideal and identification in the first place that we, we need to think about, I, I suppose. You know? The second, uh, I think, uh, and the problem actually of narcissism for me at least emerges, uh, you know, uh, through this, um, uh, Eric, you want to go first? You, Eric, you want you want to reply, respond on that? Actually, that's something I'm interested in hearing you about. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, right. yeah, I'll, try to, I'll try to answer you there. Um, 
on page 95 of the standard edition, he says, it would not surprise us if we were to find a special psychical agency which performs the task of seeing that narcissistic satisfaction from the ego ideal is ensured and which with this end in view constantly watches the actual ego and measures it by that, that ideal. What is he talking about here? He, he hasn't named it yet, but he's talking about the superego, right? So what, what is the superego for Freud? It is, it is an agency that diverts um, the id, the energy, the psychical energy, the libido from the id towards the symbolic, towards something external, the object, um, according to, to some external authority. Um, and, and, and so I think that, that is, um, in terms of group psychology, that's what that's what's going on. Uh, there is a shared superego that we can call it the big other. We could call it the primal father, the master, whatever. Um, that installs this agency of the superego, uh, and that is the the precise mechanism that uh, engenders this uh, repression of primary narcissism. And then enables this object libido, uh, phallic jouissance, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and it is the, the failure of then of that, a, a super egoic agency then that would result in what, whatever we would call narcissism. Yeah. So if we take that seriously, Eric, and if we take this sort of claim seriously of, you know, that there is something about object libido itself that is a slippage within it that you would always in some senses uh, uh, slip when you're trying to find this relationship as an object. There's always something that makes, makes there's a capacity in you to make that object part of your own superego in that sense, such that you can achieve that object without forming the direct relationship with it. There's the, all that, the, that notion of the, yeah. the notion of the introjection of an, of an object into the ego that he makes in some, in the uh, group psychology. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was also hearing kind of some echoes of that notion of interjection that he was, uh, no, you know, and, and there, there can be this narcissistic uh, mode where the, the object is interjected into the ego. And so there's a, there's a confusion here of object and ego. Exactly. Which so is, you know, yeah, one can always that. see that slippage happening, which is why there is no not just one kind of narcissism in, in that in that sense. It is actually a slippage in the in the in, in, in the in the ego's very relationship with the world outside, and that, that that's the difficult thing to think about in, in in this sense that you can always slip in that. You know, I when when I teach, I find, and even in my own self, I observe that when I start reading too much in a day, what happens? I start gaining some kind of sexual satisfaction from my reading. It's not merely I'm trying to know about the world. It starts satisfying me sexually in some senses. You know, all forms of knowledge can do that to you. So when he say the sublimation is a point at which uh, you are able to take the aim of your own drives away from sexuality in that sense. You know, he writes that towards the end of this paper itself. That you have to take those aims, uh, aim of the sex sexual, you have to take the aim of the drive away from sexual aims and towards some higher aims in, in that sense. What happens is you can you can you can always slip back and create that object I, ego ideal within yourself through which the sexual aims can come back, even when you're pretending to do these higher aims and so on and so forth. It, it, that that possibility always exists in that sense, and the structure of that possibility actually fully reveals uh, uh, reveals itself to us in psychosis and so on and so forth, which is an interesting discussion to have in what way the psychosis actually reveals the structure to us. Because in psychosis, essentially the unconscious is not working. There's a, there's a fourth closure, as you rightly said, fourth closure the real in that sense, where you can constantly pretend to be doing something when, you, when, when you're not actually doing anything in, 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 that, in, that, in that manner. So narcissism remains that slippage. Uh, the, the interesting question actually is not that it is a slippage, which, which I think we all can uh, sort of maybe some point agree with. The interesting thing is that why that slippage remains necessary such that we can remain the formal relationship with the object. The reverse is equally true. You need to be narcissistic to a certain degree so that you can form a relationship with the object. It's yeah. not simply uh, uh, 
in the one way it is almost like if there's only the object and the you the energy would be contained in a such a manner there would be a blast you need an opening from which something keeps on getting released from which your ego remains at a point from which you know that function can take this and i think that that that's something which which interests me in this uh is something which which was fascinating for me when i was reading this paper also and hearing cadel uh, in that sense uh yeah thanks In this connection, I'm really tempted, although I think this might be ill-advised to uh, associate it a little bit about how would I see, I mean, it, it is true that one can gain a lot of real satisfaction from reading, uh, discussing, understanding something really difficult and so on. So I, I would like to just, in some free sense, think about how the psychoanalytic work itself could perhaps be conceptualized as, uh, as well as Lacan says, it sort of being brings the phallic resonance and the symbolic together and makes possible for some kind of traversing of fantasies. And uh, since uh, I think that the type of picture of narcissism uh, must emerge during an analysis in some way. And it is really understandable how Freud would come as a person who develops this conception of narcissism itself, because he observes people's uh, self-image all day, basically. And when, when you think about the analytic work of, I mean, from the viewpoint of an analysant, you are lying there comfortably so that you can associate freely what you would only in your mind utter to yourself. Uh, and the picture of neurosis in Freud is that the neurotic is in, in, a, in a way it's just stuck in his or her fantasies space only. Whereas in Lacan, this develops into the idea that the reality itself has some kind of structure of fantasy and when somebody starts to associate freely, go through their troubling relations with others, starts to explain some weird ha happenings in their life and every everything like that, well, it might bring about what Lacan says in first seminar, some kind of like maximal uh, narcissistic projection, which is accompanied by some kind of real immense exaltation, some kind of like joy and everything. And Lacan says that this is just the kind of like the first stage analysis, which he thinks that it is true that this happens and it's magical and everything, but many analysts make the mistake of taking this as an end of analysis. Whereas for Lacan, it would only here really starts to sort of like, one could say desubstantialize the uh, notion of the self, and it would uh, have to take off the moorings of speech and give it way for more and more questions, more and more analysis. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I would like to say. All right, yeah, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, I would pick up on that, on what Mika was talking about there. And, and I think that something that would, and it, or in, a, in pursuing a, a treatment, uh, a clinical treatment for this kind of narcissism, um, I think it would have to run along um, the lines of the Lacanian treatment of psychosis, which is the in, insofar as analysis is capable of, of treating psychosis, is the construction of a uh, delusional metaphor. Um, but specifically in the, in the sense of the later Lacan, the notion of the syntome, uh, which is what knits together the imaginary and the symbolic that have kind of come apart um, because of, a, of a, the failure of the symbolic. And so I think what what analysis would try to do in a case of extreme narcissism is develop some 
some identification because what what is a what is a, a, a centone? It is the name of the father. It is an identification, and I think somewhere Freud actually does mention. I was trying to find it in, in his paper. He mentions something about identifications, um, and and that's precisely I think where treatment would have to go is is to find something in the the kernel of of the analyzan that can be developed as an external identification that can function as a centome that can uh, take the imaginary and to reattach it to the symbolic order. Jayati, would you like to continue from there? Uh, it's it's a new thread. So if anybody wants to continue with Eric, I can wait. Well, I guess what I what I would like. I guess if I if I had a question for for what Eric's saying, it, it's I guess it's in relationship to clinical treatment and narcissism because Freud's sort of starting this paper by saying that the narcissist escapes clinical treatment in an analytic session because of because it lacks a sort of dimension of transference are, are you would you propose a different would you say Freud's wrong in in this claim or or how would you frame what he's saying there or how did you relate to what he was saying there uh well the the narcissist uh, um eludes uh analytical treatment in in the same way that psych, uh, psychosis does and I think it was Lacan who actually was the first one to develop any sort of proper analytical treatment of psychosis. And, and I, I know to this day that most psychoanalysts that are not Lacanian do, don't even touch psychosis. They leave psychosis to psychiatrists, to neurobiology, that sort of thing. And it's considered, it would be considered malpractice to treat a psychotic. Um, and so really it's, it's only the Lacanian that would venture to probably in, in concert with, with psychiatry, I think is generally how it's done, uh, is to work with, with a, a psychotic in order to um, very carefully manage the delusional metaphor to try to create a, something of a support for the symbolic. And I, and I think that's kind of what would have to happen for a treatment of, of um, narcissism would be something, something along those lines. Okay. Jayati, would you like to go? Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, when he's talking about man, woman and this object uh, uh, libido over there, it's uh, disturbingly insightful. Um, <laughs> I, I do agree. And it, of course, it's, uh, it did make me restless. But when I thought of my own growing up and some of the beautiful girls who were there in the school and then in college, I did agree with some of the things that he was saying. Uh, the parallel that I could see, and again, I go back to what Chetan was talking about, about the group psychology text that we did, where this uh, transition from herd to hoard. So now when the group is working as a hoard and there is a leader and who is a narcissistic leader, one can again see the same kind of structure emerging uh, at that place also where you have this particular relationship which is existing between leader and other people, where there is this opacity to the leader and the leader who is a completely narcissistic being where there is a self-contentment, inaccessibility, mysterious. And also this leader like a woman over here is somebody who, who really doesn't really the fact that it becomes leader and acquires that kind of mysterious and that kind of power is also because uh, of that, uh, because of the distance.
sensing over there. And the fact that um, the, the love is quite one way, although the fact that he loves everybody is there, but yet um, it's, not, it's not of the same kind also. You also stand above everyone. And that is what makes the leader quite uh, powerful and narcissistic as a, as a figure. So I found the structure parallel um, in both the cases. Where I got stuck is when we look at the all the new leaders who are emerging in this kind of frame, be it Trump and be it uh, Modi in the Indian context, there is a gender reversal also. So that is something which I was not really able to grapple with. And I wondered if I'm even thinking in the right direction or not. Yeah, it's a, it's a super interesting framing. I, 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 um, I'm glad you brought up that, that dimension of the paper where he's des describing the sexual um, division and, and the, the sort of the castration dynamics between, between man and woman. I, 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 do, I do think that the leader, a certain type of leader um, can take on almost feminine feminine qualities that he's liking to inaccessibility and and um I, I, the like the, the, the first thing i'm thinking is the difference between the leader who's almost forcing a sort of allegiance or ad adherence to himself or a, a leader or a guru who's almost um not so much forcing but i don't know how to say it but almost waiting for people to come to him or waiting for people to come to her um, as, as a type of almost, it, it's almost, it's, and, and again, narcissism is not, not just a bad thing, but it, but it has a narcissistic dimension to it. Um, and, and, and I do think it has some feminine qualities and that, that feminine quality is, it, it's kind of the opposite of proselytizing. Do you, if you know what I mean, like it's 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 I, I'm waiting for people to come to me. If people come to me, and people identify with me, I'm open to it. But I'm not going out and looking for it. If that makes sense. Yeah, more like Gandhi. Yeah, I, I mean, there are some. There are some. Uh, I don't know as much about. I have read some some things about Gandhi. I'm, I'm sure Gandhi did. Uh, uh, Sort of operate in that way as well. The, and 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 uh, the the person the person I'm the person I'm thinking of most is uh, like the the yogis, like a like a sad guru, or uh, or 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 an Osho or a Krishnamurti. Krishnamurti is perhaps the best example, actually. Uh, Krishnamurti was certainly someone who waited for people to come to him, and, and and almost if he was forced into the position of the leader, he would reject it. But if people came to him, he would kind of accept it. And there, and, and there's a way in which people who are in that sort of enlightenment category, they do give off this impression of inaccessibility, like they have some inaccessible jouissance, like they have some inaccessible inner enjoyment, which sure. other people are looking to attain in themselves from, from almost proximity to them. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, characters like Krishnamurti and Gandhi, specifically in Indian context, are considered to be more feminine uh, yes. and so are not even looked up to rather than somebody like Modi, who acquires the aura largely because of this kind of masculinity. So, yeah. Very, yeah, good point. Yeah, I, I, get, the, I get the impression as well that these figures embody a more feminine um, quality and 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 even um, I, I'm recalling now that there's a there's a, a, ser a sermon or a, a lecture by by Osho where he explicitly says that his form of leadership is a feminine attraction that he tries to be feminine in his leadership. Um, now uh, there's I don't know who you are, but someone named iPhone has their hand raised. Hey, maybe that's me. It's Davide. Hi. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm a bit confused, to be honest, because we're talking about this um, um, comparison of this identification between narcissism and psychosis, which I can agree with it. But then uh, if we take Lacan, um, description of psychosis he talks about this uh, foreclosure of the symbolic uh, that the psychotic um, 
has like the name of the father foreclosed. And so the name of the father is coming back in the real. And uh, the reason why I'm confused is like, uh, I keep hearing this association with this reference to the Im imaginary uh, related to psych psychotic, psychotics and uh, narcissism. And I don't uh, hear anything about the real. Um, like, uh, in, in what, um, how do you explain this thing that the foreclosure in the symbolic is coming back in the real? Like, um, because if you talk, for example, about social media and video games as purely imaginary, but is that real? I mean, is that, is that like that? Because I think they are on the side of the real uh, more than on the imaginary. Um, as a virtuality that has an effect in that sense, like um, on the level of the real, and we we can see how how that uh, is is um, like working, no, in, in our world. How how much effect the social media have on the real, um, and also regarding identification, the primal identification, the the mirror stage. Um, the mirror image, yes, it's an identification, it's an imaginary identification, but it's also a real identification in the sense that it's um, implying an alienation at the same time. It's not that I, uh, and, uh, and also like, um, it's also the, the first appearing of the symbolic in the subject, the mirror stage. Like he is like in that process is perceiving himself or herself as an object among other objects and the relations between these objects are like uh, govern government by the symbolic. So it's also the emergence, not only of the, of the imaginary, but also of the, of the symbolic. So just to cut short, like I, I would like to 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 know your uh, interpretation about this. Uh, like uh, where where the real is gone, like in the psychotics and in the narcissism. Thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, Eric, did you did you want to answer that? I think you said in the chat. Yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, what what is the real in this case? What is the real that the symbolic returns in? And it's, uh, the real is the impossible. It is the impossible to represent, either to represent through the image or the symbolic. So the, the real is, is there. Um, and and what, what happens is, is that the, the symbolic returns in the real and precisely because it becomes unrepresentable, okay? So uh, the, the real is, um, it's there, but, but, but also it becomes unattached from the imaginary such that the imaginary is, is unable to cover over the, the real to, to um, you know, the, 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 the imaginary is kind of like a, a film strip where you have individual cells of the film strip. And the real is kind of like what's, what's in between each individual cell. And when, when the, the, the real and the imaginary become unattached, and I'm thinking here of the, the Borromean knot, um, the, there's a, a sense in which the, the, that picture, that flowing, moving picture ceases to cover over the gap uh, in, that is the real. And so what was impossible to, um, to represent in, the, in the, the symbolic and what is impossible to represent in the imaginary uh, can become more, more present in, in that sense. So, um, 
And so but in what form? Like in what form? Like present in what form? Because it, it, it's it's like still an image. Like well, it it's would. Like, it's, it's, it's like pre- uh, because it's otherwise, present. yeah, it's present in in the real, um, in in the sense of it's there and it's and it's uh, affecting the subject, but but not through a representable form. You know, for for us uh, for a psychotic language is something that is like experienced as an external force. It, it assaults them, um, and, and ra- so rather than um, r- rather than than language being a kind of a part of who you are and, and tool that you use, language is something external and something that has this um, mode of assaulting with someone from the outside. Uh, and, th- and that's kind of what I mean is um, the real becomes something that uh, it, we, we, you can't cover it over with the imaginary, but it becomes more ap- apparent in, in the way that it affects, affects you. Miko or Ale- Alexandra, did you did you yes. did, you, did you have something directly to, to flow into this? Line yes, I would like to answer to Davide. Thank you so much, Davide, for your question. Uh, yes, uh, um, the psychotic hallucinates. So the hallucination, the visual hallucination, is. Uh, the most uh, known uh, from the psychiatric clinic and from life uh, is the most uh, best example for how the real uh, manifests. Uh, so it's very, psychotic... it's very interesting what you're saying. It's very interesting what you say about the hallucination because it's, isn't it hallucination of pure image? Uh, that's what, so that's like, what, yeah, that's the yeah. real, right? Yeah, the that's, real that's, is not something yeah. material, but it's a pure image. So it's, yes, it's, but it's I where want the to, image overlaps the real. Like it's very interesting indeed, and I was asking myself. But first of all, we have to to take in consideration all the time when we are talking about these realms, uh, real, symbolic, and imaginary. We have to take in consideration all the time that uh, in life they are all the time intertwined. You have never pure real, pure uh, symbolic or pure imaginary. They are overlapped all the time, more or less, I think. So uh, this, um, now I force the limit and I asked you, Davide, uh, maybe um, that, I, I, I want to ask you something. Is there any possibility that what we call reality, the majority of people that are neurotics, I think, more or less, is it possible that what we call real is also a common sense hallucination or not? To compare it with a unique singular hallucination that comes from unconscious, of the psychotic? That's a very tricky and maybe too extreme question. Do you understand my question? May I intervene in here quickly because I have just very short time and I'm moving locations and everything. It's, it's connection, connecting to this topic of uh, psychosis. Well, I was reminded that uh, Freud thinks that the kind of like artificial reality that the psychotic creates for he himself. It's a sort of like a secondary process to narcissism, but he also says that it's a kind of an attempt for recovery for the psychotic. So we might benefit from separating uh, in the way that Daria Leader does so splendidly in his works on madness between going mad and being mad. So um, what I was thinking of in regards to the whole fascination with hallucinations, I think that's 
I, I tend to think that this is contrary to the way that Freud approaches psychosis and contrary to the way that Lacan then elaborates on psychosis. Since they aren't that interested in the imaginary aspect of psychosis, but instead by the way that they find words, they find language operating in psychosis. Thanks, Mika. D David, did you want to did you want to respond to any of that? Uh, no, <laughs> I'm still thinking. Okay, Chitana? I would I would just uh, to add something to what Mika said. Yes, um, uh, it's very uh, bad sometimes. Even the um, the the official uh, psychiatry is doing it to take uh, uh, the hallucination from the psychotic. This hallucination can have a, how to say, can in a way, uh, it, this hallucination has a positive role for, for uh, the psychotic in the sense that it helps. It sustains his, uh, it covers in a, in a good way his gap. It gives a sense to his uh, fear, to his uh, abyss. So taking hallucination and uh, from the psychotic um, is not always very good, I think, from the Lacanian point of view. Even if uh, official psychiatry fights all the time against, uh, against hallucinations. That's, that's a different approach here between but uh, official medicine, psychiatry, and Lacanian approach. But can 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 we really draw a line between secondary hallucination and uh, what we call reality? That like, that was uh, my question. That yeah, was my question. Exactly. I don't think it's possible to do that. In fact, like in a way, like uh, no, there is Zizek that talks about Jesus Christ, for example, as a psychotic. So as the psychotic is really touching the real. And um, so I don't think that it's really uh, resisting criticism, this, uh, di di this uh, difference between secondary reality and, and real reality. Like, uh, I think uh, it's, uh, it's reality, it's an hallucinatory phenomenon in this sense, as, because it's real because that's the real so you answered my question <laughs> okay but it's contraintuitive because uh, usually people are very identified with uh, with the symbolic and imaginary and uh, with common sense so it's very risky to take this uh, from them Can I elaborate on something about yeah, Mika, what, what I was reminded of also uh, in con connection more to what Jayoti said. Uh, there, there is the discussion about the uh, really uh, good looking woman, but also Freud has a snar snarky good comments that the uh, type of like comedians and criminals might give this type of like charismatic view that they have somehow escaped <laughs> the the the, the troubles of narcissism and everything. And here, I think that the, the discussion was really fascinating about the type of like narcissistic or charismatic leaders and the image of some like old crook explaining his life like in a, in a really comic fashion comes to mind, but yeah. <laughs> it's great, Chetan? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly sort of respond to the discussion that was happening and you know, uh, two points. One, basically, one, there is no direct access to real possible. You know, that, that kind of a, uh, you know, we, we sometimes get into thinking that, that we, we can access real directly or we are closer to real in some senses in one place than the other, you know, and, and we sort of get, get in some kind of twist with ourselves when we start imagining that, uh, you know, this, this 
uh, uh, this fantasy of they are getting a direct access to something which you know which actually end, end up going back into so from that lens if you look at lacan's notion of symbolic it's a very interesting question that is you know this question of language that comes in lacan it's a very interesting problem because it's not like lacan symbolic is simply giving you a division between language and reality it's not in fact it is it is telling you that language is the thing through which some kind of an overlap in within the real can be known to us that that is what becomes clear to you when you say unconscious structured like a language there is something of unconscious is a gap isn't it is a gap then in what way is it structured like a language if you really want to ask that question you'll you'll understand that it is structured like a language in in, in this very particular sense that that gap becomes available to us to this modality or this, this this shape or this 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 thing that we call symbolic in some senses and then we have to trace that in what way do we imagine do we do we place imaginary over there because imaginary is again uh, you know uh, uh, that uh, uh, that dimension of language in that in that sense which which fails fails to do its own job which fails to overlap with itself and so on and so forth so given that that kind of a thing then how do we understand this this problem of schizophrenia and its relationship to the real and there is always this this discussion that schizophrenics actually have a closer relationship to reality than you can have otherwise there is always a discussion that comes back i remember reading a very interesting novel by doris lessing uh, Uh, it's the last part of her uh, children of violence series in that sense where she actually engages with the schizophrenic and she writes at some point that uh, that what a person was going through that at some point in her in, in her childhood if uh, another person she had delusions she was seeing people she was seeing things and so on and so forth so at some point in the childhood somebody would have come and asked her very politely that what are you seeing describe that thing for us tell us what you are seeing what you are thinking what you are you know and we and you would have given the respect of reality to that to, to those delusions that person might have become cured you know there is something to that insight which we need to think about that in what way are we constructing a reality for ourselves um it, it's a difficult thing i i i'll not pretend to have answers over here i'm just raising that question because it was very interestingly brought up by her in the in the in the, in the fictional space but i think there is an insight that she has which is which is valuable in a discussion like this without thank you so much thank you so much that, you know, without slipping into that that simplistic idea that we have direct access to real and reality and physical phenomena and some reality we don't and so on and so forth thank you so much chetan for for what you said because it's about um excusing us in front of psychotics and in front of psychotic reactions uh and uh, it's a problem of ethics it's a problem of ethical approach toward uh, this way in which uh, in a psychotic even if i don't like to say psychotic in a psychotic episode in the experience of psychotic episode um there is a return of the repressed from the unconscious so uh, the return of the repressed from the unconscious through this gap is manifesting as a hallucination yes and we have to respect and to open toward this but we are afraid of it because because it's not make it's not fitting in our common sense normal world normal path world you know it's not fitting and then we are afraid and we reject it and we cure it yes uh but we have to become open toward it without being afraid and to honor this experience that that is not easy for for the person who is having it so we it's another ethical attitude towards the the person the singularity of that uh, person who is going through this uh, extraordinary experience we have to honor it and thank you that you said this but picking up on this that you have just said um aren't we all psychotics in this sense in in uh, in a way that we are all have um primordial you can call it repression right as human beings like uh the the primordial fantasy the primordial repression so in all of us the real is coming back as repressed as 
as what we call reality and, and the fact that we all share this repression, this fundamental repression, it makes it normal in a way. But it's still the same process. So. Okay, this was this was fantastic, guys. This was a great discussion. Just to sort of add, it uh, even though we all are getting back that repressed in the psychotic stage, the the question of symbolic gets blocked to you. The unconscious is no longer pulsating, so one has to be aware of that also. That it's not simply that they are getting certain hallucinations and we can't understand what they're experiencing. It's not simply that. It is also a point at which they themselves can't break through their own hallucinations. And that has to be respected also. That, that has to be kept in mind when that engagement is shaping for us in that sense. And how do we think through it? Please go ahead, sorry, yeah. If I may, I, I was reminded that Freud says that's in this paper on narcissism, that's, um, well, he thinks that psychosis really gives insight into the workings of narcissism, he says. But narcissism gives insight to the workings of ego. So there is a connection there that might be handy, but I wouldn't go as far as to say that everybody is all the time a psychotic. Thank you. All right. Does anyone else have anything else else to add? Any closing remarks? I think this brought up a lot of a lot of interesting discussion, a lot of challenging a challenging discussion, and and again, as 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 normally happens, we we attempt to filter a lot of what we're reading here in Freud through Lacanian terminology and, and attempting to sort of make sense of modern 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 psychology and our own psyches uh, a lot through the the categories of the imaginary the symbolic and the real um categories like neurosis and psychosis uh sort of again sort of emphasizing the degree to which lacan really reinvents freudian psychology with uh with new useful uh conceptual frameworks and um Maybe I'll just I'll just add here uh, as a sort of summary of the paper we covered in our discussion on narcissism that Freud was really here motivated in this paper to discuss um, whether or not the libido theory could be applied to narcissism, given that um, we're not dealing necessarily with the transference problems of libido, but really dealing with direct uh, ego libido itself. Um, and in that sort of discovering, or at least proposing the idea that the narcissist is a direct embodiment of the primal libido itself, the autoerotic nature of the libido, um, the nature of the libido not to uh, go beyond itself towards an object or not to go beyond itself into the world, into the symbolic, um, but to remain with itself and in itself and enjoying itself uh, for itself, let's say. Um, and in sort of exploring that sort of oppositional dynamic between the narcissistic tendency uh, we get a interesting view of the extreme polarities of the psyche. Um, on the one end, the narcissistic tendency, on the other end, the um, neurotic tendency, let's say. Um, and ultimately, at least according to Freud, we I do think we get some path. I think the ethical path that he articulates in this paper is one of sublimation where what is really being what 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 the what the psyche is really striving for is a type of balance between ego libido and object libido where ego libido is overflowing into object libido um, and that there are challenges and pitfalls to one extreme or the other and that in sexual division we do get a tendency to one or the other 
Um, all right. So that 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 I think summarizes. I hope that to the best of best of my abilities, the paper on narcissism. I want to thank everyone for this discussion and for your attention throughout the last two hours. Um, and other than that, I'm going to close up. Uh, so thank you guys so much for your for your time, and I'll I'll see you guys hopefully next time. Thank you, Gadel. You're wonderful. Thanks a lot.